Mr. John Pierce, you have since retired from the police force, but can you give me a sense of the particular series of events which led up to now known elements of police corruption and abuse which first came to your attention in and around 1979? Uh, right, well, the whole process were uh, extremely unorthodox, to put it mildly. I uh, were working through Obet Station CID in Leeds, but we're also undercover and operating under the instructions of uh, DCI's Michael Martin and Roger Frampton of AC10. That's the anti corruption unit based at the London Met. There had recently been a particularly brutal murder of a middle-aged black man and my colleague in the CID had arrested the prime suspect a young man named Michael Gallagher um, they'd done some background checks on him like um, and before charging him uh, with the offence at uh, Olbeck Nick, we took him to an undisclosed location. And my colleague uh, reckoned that um, he would be able to ascertain whether he was guilty of this nasty and uh, what we strongly felt were a racially motivated crime. You use now the collective term we. Who was party to this alongside yourself? Back old yes. Jack McIntyre. I take it you are seeking a confession from the suspect? Yes, I was. Thank you. Please continue. Uh, An informer to McIntyre had mentioned that he frequented a particular pub in the town centre. Uh, so McIntyre went along there and uh, by sheer good fortune he saw the suspect as he was emerging from the pub on his own. So he nicked him from behind, cuffed him and rendered them unconscious by the use of chloroform before sticking them in the car. I met up with the pair of them at the location and in one of the gobby rooms there we set up a movie camera with an um, Elmo Brand Super 8 model. A bit rough and ready. Uh, nothing like your sophisticated uh, digital uh, devices of an hour days. But I had a magnetic strip on the film which could pick up sound. So uh, it, it was quite good for, for, for those days anyway. Um, uh, I belonged to McIntyre because he, he, he wanted to film the interview with Gallica. Um, I guess this was a regular <laughs> thing, him <laughs> um, making round on toward recordings to show his associates, but uh, uh, he said he, he said it was to be kept by him as a memento. That, that, that was the reason he gave. So I went along with it. Um, I was wearing a, a surveillance microphone which was being uh, 
as access by AC10 officers in an incognito van. So we had uh, an additional audio recording of the, of the, of the event. I understand uh, the anti-corruption units have since recovered the film. Uh, the day, uh, pa pass it on to your film crew. Yes, Mr. Pierce, we do have it. We have enhanced the audio and visuals as much as possible. We, we will be using it in this documentary. Now, please, tell me what happened in the location you mentioned. Well, I remember how dark it was when he came round, like, <laughs> clearly very distressed. But he was trying to uh, mask his true feelings. <laughs> Uh, a day were brought home to me. A day etched in my memory. A day I'll never forget. Wait, that's a camera on. Get him to his feet. Come on, what the fuck are you saying? Um, doing it. I've got to get him over there. Chris, John, keep a hold of him. Back here. Back. Just chop him. Just chop him. Just chop him. Just chop him. <laughs> <laughs> What's your name? <laughs> what? Confirm your name. <laughs> Michael Gallagher. Age. And day of birth. 23. I'm born. 15th. 56. Right. <clears throat> Michael Gallagher. So, got a job. Where exactly are we? What is this? Did you drug me? What the hell is happening? Why did you do that? Who are you? Why am I here? Why did you bring me here? Are you police? This isn't a police station, is it? Have you kidnapped me? Is that what this is? I am in me. <laughs> Why ask the fucking questions? You answer them. Got it? Understand? Do you comprehend? Now, for your information, I'm Detective Sergeant John Pierce, CID, West Yorkshire Police. Do you have a job? I'm a civil engineer. Good. Good. Right. Now, today's Sunday, right? Are you a man of faith? What? Have you been taking any form of uh, spiritual counselling, so to speak? By that I mean if you talk to a priest, a minister. A rabbi or that like that? No. I haven't been undertaking counselling. No, have I chatted with anyone like that? Anyone from within the medical profession? Well, 
I saw my doctor. He said that I may have a stress-related condition, and this isn't exactly helping. You want to see a psychiatrist? Do you have any form of uh, mental illness? Depression? No. Off your chump? Mentally deranged? None of that stuff? No! Look! What is this? Why am I here? So, religious faith, where are you? I'm a Catholic. If indeed it bears even the remotest connection towards anything superficially resembling your business. Miss Math recently. In a confession lately. Well, as a matter of passing interest, it would seem that I've missed Math today, actually. The result of my being don't kidnapped and detained here. Much against my personal choice, I might add. Oh, well, you see, Ben D. Mr. Galka, that's bad. That may result in a mortal sin. Not at all a pleasant proposition in the eyes of our maker. The Almighty. See, the reason I ask that is because uh, I have to know how you're doing up here. See, missing mass and not confessing. Well, should you inadvertently happen to uh, snuff it, so to speak, before I haven't had a chance to um, unload, and then contrition to and from the priest of your choice, well, um, it kind of adds an indelible stain in your soul, apparently. It needs to get burned off to get rid of it. See, there's a sell by date kind of thing there, you see, if, uh, if you don't confess in time, like, well, you don't get the automatic deletion. Oh, see, you're stuck with it. Understand? In case you don't know that. Is that so? Yes. Now, you will need to get that nasty, bad, mortal sin burned off. Now, I could do that for you if you like. If you cooperate with me, because I have a hotline to redemption. <sighs> Open all hours. Just cut out the middle, man. You confess to me. I clear up your soul and Bob's your uncle. You're quite clearly deranged. <laughs> this is utterly ridiculous. So, to the dating question. Monday, 14th April 1979. Where were you from 5 pm on that day? What? How am I supposed to re recall a random date? At least a Monday, if that helps. Oh. Easter. Monday. Let me think. Oh, it was a colleague's birthday. We went for a steak at the Burnley Inn on the High Street. So, return to Monday 14th. But then have the other students stay in your character. Small matter. A chap called Paul and Levy Phillips, who is deceased. So, 
Tell me about the uh, altercation between you and Mr. Phillips. Who? Oh, stop funnying about. Oh, don't know who he is. Was, sorry. So you tell me exactly. Okay, who okay, was. okay, okay. I saw him. He was cagey, suspicious, creeping about, furtive, you know. <coughs> you know, you're going to find a lot of scrutiny over this. This person being white, would you have felt the same way? Well, yes, probably. <laughs> you see, this man had no criminal record whatsoever. He was a good type, a mild man fella. Here, sit down. Right, now, let's talk about you, Michael Gallagher, well educated and from good English stock. So, but from how you've just described the now deceased, do you accept that you have somewhat extreme views? I beg your pardon. You're racist. No, I am not. Admit it. I repeat, I I'm not a racist. Why do you say that? Because that's not what I am. I think it is. It's not. You are. I am not. You hate blacks. I don't like them. You despise them. I put up with them. No, you don't. I do. Admittedly, somewhat reluctantly, but I do. You can't stand them. I tolerate them. You detest them. I do not. You do? I don't. Tell the truth. I am. That's what I'm doing. You're evading the truth. On the contrary. You're evading. I reject that. You reject blacks. I told you. You didn't mean it. You're questioning my integrity. You're a liar, that's why. This is ridiculous. I just want some honesty. Honesty? Yes. Never heard of it. It's what I'm giving you. You're me. giving me untruths and racist opinions. I am not. Yes, you are. How can you say that? Because I can. You've no right. I certainly have. And why is that? I'm in the police. And that's why I'm here. Why are you here? You did this to me. Did what? You made me this way. You made you a racist. I'm not a racist. Why are you then? I did what I had to do. Which was? Your fucking job. My job? All of you. All of them, the police! How are we to blame for this? Cause and effect. Just own up. To what? The murder of Paul and Lady Phillips. Why should I? Because you did it! I yes. did not! Yes, you did! See that? That was taken obviously before the stab wound. The expert stab wound to his neck, of course. Apparently, so I'm led to believe, severing the carotid artery in the neck cuts off the blood supply to the brain, leaving the poor victim conscious for up to oh, 30 seconds as it spurts out so much blood it causes asphyxiation and death. I mean, you bloody well knew <laughs> that, didn't you? Doesn't even resemble manslaughter. More like cold, calculated, premeditated murder. Now, obviously, a lot of questions have been brought up, as in, uh, were you unarmed? 
could it have been self-defence? Did he have on his person anything that could be construed as a weapon? Isn't it enough that he assaulted me? Punched me repeatedly? And then when I started yelling for help, he grabbed my head and started to slam it into the ground. Did you have your head on it? Yes, hey, why this? <laughs> don't remember. You don't remember? How come you have no indication of bruising at all? No black eyes, cut nose, bruised face, none of that. No. It all cleared up. So what? Now, do you recognise the chap in this photograph? The same chap that you saw the night of these events? I can't tell for certain. They do all look depressingly similar. Simple as that. That's his neck, that is. After the stab wound. The expert stab wound to his neck, of course. Now, I've shown you these because you're going to have to deal with this in open court and under oath and under some very, very serious pressure. That's just the way these things work. Now, I don't mean to torture you. You're going to have to talk to me about the situation before it goes anywhere else. You listen to me. He was nothing more than a revolting, low-light piece of black shit. See, where the big question comes into play is this. What is it that enraged him so badly? I th Could it possibly be that maybe he felt he were being taunted by you? Isn't it that you provoked Phillips? You goaded him. In effect, you yelled insults at him. And this story of yours of him skulking around suspiciously was not the case at all. Now, if that indeed is what took place, it may very well change things quite substantially. Then all of a sudden you're looking at something you never dreamed you'd be looking at. That's why we're here today. See, my purpose in life, my raison d'etre, if you will, in the light of your prevarication, is to inform you of the consequences of your actions. Next on the list is this prison, the harsh reality of incarceration which is ominous by its looming presence on the very cusp of your horizon. Now, <clears throat> are you all set for a life in a world where the daily fragrance will be the odious putrid aroma of 2,000 incarcerated men's urine, half a ton of hot, steaming, overboiled cabbage, <laughs> 10,000 wet anal expulsions of noxious air, where you will receive the venal torment of an unwashed, fetid 18 yard on being rammed agonisingly into your tiny arsehole without lubrication, obviously. Or onking. Oxygen pair of foul socks. Big Nigel the rapist. Up in the foot. None of which I've seen a wash in six weeks being stuck right into your mouth. Simply because he wants to. Then Lars Larry. 
who has procured a set of rusty industrial pliers will remove all of your teeth without anaesthetic, <laughs> obviously. So you can give them a better blow job. Excuse me. Are these really necessary now? No, it's not. You're not going anywhere. Thank you. Now, with a card in your possession. Here it is. You are membership number 1666 of the NSAP. <coughs> uh, Tell me where that is. It's just a group of friends. Friends? Friends of what? Tell me what the NSAP is. Just friends. A club. Sort of. NSAP. Tell me about it. it. Just, we meet. We actually met that night in the Burnie Inn. That's where we meet. So where do you call his birthday party? Uh, no. So you've been lying to me? No, not quite. Not really. Don't piss in my pocket. Tell me it's fucking raining. You and your colleagues, you were the National Socialist Action Party. A right-wing fascist mob with a relentlessly racist agenda. So once again, have you got problems with black people? No. I'm going to ask you again, this time I want the truth. Do you have problems with anyone who isn't white, Caucasian, Anglo-Saxon? <laughs> uh, background, Sonny Jim. Where I'm gravitating to here is this. Isn't it the case that Mr. Paulden Levy Phillips was, to all intents and purposes, just a normal, respectable man? Who happened to be black? But within your fucked up, xenophobic, illiberal, hatred fueled proclamation. People like him an affront to your sensibilities. No comment. Well I could comment and hazard a pretty accurate fucking guess in the affirmative swastika boy. Something you uttered at volume, no doubt, got him so enraged, he reacted with force. I'm telling you right now, that man had no violent background. No homicidal tendencies that he could find. So what made him snap? <coughs> he wasn't drunk and he went on drugs. So could you fill in that blank? I didn't... How close to your car did he get? Maybe a car. Well, what set him off? I don't know. Did you call him a chombo? A cliff ape, a coon, a spade, a darky, a ditto monkey? See, it doesn't fit. It's not fit the profile that you alleged occurred. When he walked up to your car. <laughs> Oh. 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 I didn't expect to have a Well, I didn't confront him, you see. So you're not afraid of him, eh? No, that's it. No. <laughs> so you shouted something. <laughs> he heard you. 
And he's meeting you into your car quicker than you expected. <coughs> hey. Dad, you don't go down like this. Huh? Eh? Foul black face. <laughs> Stop getting obnoxious, stinking so hard, splashing <coughs> over you. Who can solve it? Um, <laughs> all that you hate, low in despise, <laughs> forcing you down, making you sick to your stomach, <laughs> black, just getting close to something against you. I tell you, touching you, and we'll do it. All that vile and anger. <coughs> what does it say? Do it! I, I, I called him a dirty, manky old black. Empty bastard fronted nigger! <laughs> he was shot out from his mother's filthy cunt! <laughs> he let me go and pull back, releasing his grasp. I had a knife, a blade in my sock. I had the knife in my fist and I ran it, ripped it down beneath his jaw. So you're telling me you're admitting that you used a knife and severely, critically, fatally slashed him in the neck. I panicked. Well, I still don't get it. All this. You say you're not a racist. I'm not. No. Why did you go and do Antagonise him. Taunt them, abuse him. Why did you hate this particular, specific, middle-aged black man with so much rage and vengeance? Because... Because... Don't ask me that! Don't make me say it, please! Say it! Don't! I don't! Just leave it! Say it! Say I, it! I can't. Say it! I'm I gone! You'd better tell me! Now! Last year. My young sister, Laura, it was her fourth birthday. Right, your sister, go on. I was with her and my mum, and we were at a Radio 1 roadshow in Whitby. all happened uh, so quickly. I went over to get some ice cream for her and my mum. Mum stopped and opened her handbag. She wanted to give me some cash. It only took a minute or two and then when we looked round, the boy was gone. She just disappeared. She had a habit of wandering off. Mum was frantic. I was frantic. Panicked. She screamed out her name and shouted and raced around everywhere. But we'd be so full of side streets and cobbled lanes that Mum was demented, so out of her mind with worry. 
she was crying and I was yelling out Laura's name and it must have been about 20 minutes later we'd been searching around everywhere aimlessly frantically And then I turned into a lane, and I, I saw an elko. And then I saw it. It was that, that Phillips, and that bastard from television, Jimmy fucking Savile. He had his his trousers down. They ripped off Laura's dress and her pants. She was naked. He was raping her from behind. She was screaming. And then he began pushing himself into her mouth. And then they both saw me, and they just threw Laura down to the ground. She was numb and sobbing. And then Savile, he stared at me, and he laughed. And then Keen Phillips ran off down the lane and into a car. But then there was my mom. When she saw what happened, she took it in and froze for a moment. Like she turned to stone and walked expressionless towards Laura and just held her close. Then it happened. She looked up to the sky. Her mouth opened so wide, tears just poured from both of her eyes. Absolute silence. Then it came. The noise that she made, it wasn't like a proper cry. It was the most terrifyingly loud, bleak, wailing noise. It would, it would break any person's heart. Like nothing I'd ever heard before. That's what Savile did to my family. I think you're wrong about Savile. Oh, fuck that. Shut yourself, Pierce. I can't listen to any more of this fabricated bullshit. And as for you, I just need to clarify a couple of things with you, pal. Number one, we're the savage butchering of a defenceless individual. And number two, you have made some very, very ugly remarks against a man who is treasured by the nation. Treasured? <laughs> then he should be buried like treasure, 20 feet deep. Never to be dug up again. 
preferably with his gargoyle head caved in first. <laughs> my man, we certainly do seem to have an alarming tendency towards violence, don't we? <clears throat> you see, that will not do. We can't even be having that. For he's revered, so he is. And that's all down to that fine, charitable work that Mr. Savile does. It's all the kindness of his own heart. It's all the front. Can't you see that? It's still out there. A grotesque, bastard paedophile. Do you God alone knows what to other kids? And not one of your apathetic lot seems willing to give a solitary shit. I just wanted to achieve some fucking justice. Something you all seem to be out paying to avoid doing. Something you're actually paid to do. I should be in a proper police station. And I need to see my MP. And I don't need you to focus, pal. You see, that's here for you. Decision time. You have to decide where you're going with this. We story of yours. Are you a victim or are you a vigilante? My MP. Your MP. Fine. Right. This MP of yours, does he have an actual name? He's quite well known. Smith. Sir Smith. Him. And you said you dropped him to a police station in Manchester to report this. When? When was that? Last year? Yes. It, yes, it's Stratford it was. Wait. Ah. Uh, I remember you. That Scottish accent. You had a moustache back then. I knew it seen your face. That's right, you were there. You and all those other police officers, you laughed. You did nothing about it, did you? Nothing. Now I know why they call you all the filth. Right! John, I want. What? We need to have a word to side. But first, Right, this Smith character that Gallagher mentioned, Cyril Smith, the MP, do you know him? Yes, yes, of course I know him. Huge fat one. Can hardly bloody miss him, what about him? Right, if Gallagher reckons he's his MP, well... Well what? Okay, listen, there was an article some time back in a wee regional paper, the Rochdale Alternative Press. I had to hope I wouldn't have to mention this, but... But what did it say? It did a piece on Smith, and it mentioned Jimmy Savile, and well, the cover-up of the complaints against him. Cover-ups? Complaints? About what? You'll see it soon enough. But it gave details on Savile and Smith's sexual abuse of some youngsters, and it implicates Manchester and West Yorkshire forces as part of that cover-up. They claimed they've got irrefutable evidence against them and others, but most importantly against us and the force. For Christ's sake! Is this real? Sadly, aye, it is. And now, uh, on top of that, we've got Gallagher's claim that Saddle sexually abused his wee sister, and that we did fuck all about it when he came in to report it. What the hell are you telling me? I'm telling you this. No charges were ever brought on Gallagher's complaint, or on any of the other ones, not a single one. And all the records? Destroyed. What? You actually tell me you knew about all this. Uh-huh. And you did nothing. That's right. 
In the name of God, man. You, you deliberately kept quiet about everything. Uh, give me a fucking break, John. We had to keep quiet on it. We had no option. They made us sign the official bloody secrets act to keep our mouths shut. That's how serious this is. But no, we Phillips his murder. Christ. Can you even begin to imagine Gallagher let loose in court? He blew the whistle on Savile, on Smith. But worse than that, much worse, he'd start on all the others in the force. This whole thing could just explode into one huge bastard of a mess. Gallagher has to be stopped. That's why I wanted us to bring him here, well out the road and away for the spotlight, before any formal interview back at Holbeck. I needed to know, I needed to hear how much he knows, and by fuck, he knows plenty. I don't believe this. How could something like this happen? We have to sort this out, you and me. Nobody way! Fuck off! I need to sign up for shit like this. What the hell are you saying? We need to deal with no this! No chance! You refuse to be... You should have refused to be part of the cover up! You fucking bottled it! What does that say about you, man? Eh? It's your problem. You deal with it. I'm having nothing to do with it. Or you. Don't you dare get on the wrong side of me, John. You don't want me as an enemy. And will you listen to me, McIntyre? You might be able to frighten the shit out of the suspects. Your bully boy tactics don't scare me. I've always known you were bent. You slippery ducking and diving antics. Now this, this, this is something else. God alone knows why I agreed to take part in this ridiculous sword in a clandestine farce. And not take him straight to the station. As we should have done. You fucking coerced me. I th thought it was just to help, help you get a result. Now you tell me you've been right banging this center of an almighty cover up with fucking low life pedophiles. That poor lad in there, he said it all. We are filth. We don't seem to give a shit anymore if we ignore crimes like this. See what they buy. I don't want you as my enemy. I see what his hell don't want you as a friend either. You could up the obnoxious Scottish cunt. Who the fuck do you think you're talking to? Like I'm no Pierce, you are involved. Okay, let's just calm down a wee bit here, eh? Before we leave here, I just want a last wee word with him, okay? Then we'll take him back to the neck and get him charged. And you can maybe sort out a duty brief. Some naive young dickhead who won't ask too many awkward questions. Gallagher's got a hell of a lot to be angry about. Aye, maybe so. But look, come on. Let's take him into the other room and I'll bring him round again. Don't forget the camera. Thanks, John. Eh? You know Mr. Smith's a very busy man. Don't you worry. They're going to sort you about right, good solicitor. <laughs> so this is how we're going to play this. Yes. We're going to take you back to the station. We're going to go over this all over again. But in a much more civilised and friendly manner. <laughs> As for the incident itself, 
you bumped into that Philip's character. Whoa. A fracas ensued, and it all got me out of hand. The man's responsibility, all that shit. You don't have any previous, which is good, because that allows us to cop what we call here in the trade a deal. But in return for all that, it's just one very important thing. You leave Savo's name out here. Because mentioning him would bring far too much adverse attention to the case. You could find yourself in the right end of 20 bloody years, Michael. We don't want that, do we? Nah. So, keep your nose clean, bide your time, and you'll be out of there before you know it. Six months tops. How does that sound, eh? How does it sound? <clears throat> it sounds like... Fuck you! Ah, ah, you just listen to me, you ungrateful wee asshole. You will do precisely what I fucking tell you to do. You get me? Ah, ah, you will button it on Savo and take this arrangement. Ah, ah, ah. Because the alternative for you is you thinking about Sam. <coughs> Because oh. I can see to it, oh, and make no mistake, but I'll, I'll fucking see to it that the only way you come out of prison is in a wooden box. Or, oh. at the very earliest, it'll be two very long decades before you're kicking about in a public street again. <sighs> Why? And in addition to that, your ass will be permanently placed in the seat of a fucking wheelchair. I hope we understand each other now. Do we? You disgust me. All of you. Alright. You're a mole. You're scum! I'm ah. just about up to hear you fucking answer! Fuck it up! Just get away from me! The people need to know! They need to know! Later that evening, following a brief interview back at Albert Police Station, Gallagher had a meeting with renowned QC uh, Angela Bradbury. My job differs fundamentally from a standard legal aid solicitor, Mr Gallagher, as I am a QC, a Queen's Counsel, in other words, a barrister appointed by the Queen on the suggestion of the Lord Chancellor. Queen's Counsel is a status conferred by the Crown that is recognised by courts. Members such as myself, enjoy the privilege of sitting within the bar of the court. Put more simplistically, however, I am a skilled and experienced criminal defence lawyer. I represent the people of this world who have some need of more humanity in their case. I identify and interview new witnesses and I gather records that the prosecution lawyers can't find in order to test the Crown's case against the defendant. If the Crown's case crumbles, or if the accused is found guilty, I then use this fresh evidence to ensure acquittal, or to challenge the prisoner's conviction and sentence in the Court of Appeal. Failure to develop evidence is a theme in many cases where the charges can be reduced substantially and in extreme cases, actually dropped. Under-resourced criminal defence lawyers often struggle to find the time to interview witnesses before memories fade and data evaporates. Indeed, some solicitors even assume it's not even part of their job, that investigation should solely be a province for the police. I should mention that I'm given to understand 
that Detective Sergeant Jack McIntyre originally insisted an inexperienced duty solicitor <clears throat> be appointed for you. Well, why then? Of all people, are you here? Well, I think we can understand D.S. McIntyre's desire to have an inexperienced solicitor involved to assure his vested interests were met. However, I spoke at length with Detective Sergeant John Pierce. While he in no way condones your action in killing Phillips, he finds himself somewhat in the horns of a dilemma. You need to give me some idea of precisely what it is that you need me to talk about. What I need from you today is some background on yourself and how this event impacted <clears throat> upon you. I certainly don't wish to labour you too greatly by asking that you repeat all the precursory elements prior to meeting the late Mr Phillips, but I do need more insight into the revelation that one James Wilson Vincent Savile was in fact the inducement towards your later actions. But for now, tell me as much as you possibly can about your involvement with the NSAP. They'd asked me not to breach any confidences about their activities. Mr Gallagher, if I am to represent you in court, I do require this, as it's fundamental to the process which led you to Paul Don Lee <coughs> Phillips. I'm not sure about this. I respect your position, but equally, you have to respect mine. I'm not a police officer, nor am I an informant. Now, how did you first make contact? I made friends with an engineer colleague of mine. Neil Gladstone. We were having a drink one evening in town and a couple of NSAP chaps were standing at the bar. I could see there was some form of connection, communication sort of thing happening between them and Neil. But he was attempting not to acknowledge it. Eventually I asked him directly, and after some evasion, he told me about them. For the record, how did he describe <clears throat> the NSAP and their activities? They gained some notoriety a couple of years ago. You know, with their violent rhetoric and, well, because of several exposés regarding the group's stockpiling of weapons and plans for armed attacks. Okay, and? Well, the NSAP was the brainchild of a man named Tony Malski. What can I tell you? He'd been organising things. He had an involvement with the British movement and connections with John Tyndall. Him, of the National Front. But Malski was much more intent on force than discussion, though. He had a stockpile of weapons that he had seized from a raid somewhere, I think, <coughs> on a territorial army base. But he wanted a lot more action, so he broke away with his colleague, Phil Kersey, his name was, to establish the NSAP. And violence was at its heart? Would that be a correct and accurate assumption? 
Yes. This new outfit had a sort of military-style structure and sub-movements too. The militancy of the NSAP attracted quite a bit of press attention. It was Malski and Kersey who were in the pub that night. And Neil asked them over. He could see I was curious. How did the conversation go? I had a few drinks. Well, more than a few. And I disclosed what had happened to Laura a few weeks earlier. Kersey in particular went ballistic. He doesn't have a lot of time for black people. And when I mentioned that this one had assisted Savile, that was it. They had planned to attack Jimmy Savile too? Oh yes. I didn't stay too long at the flat in Hague Square. But I went along to the book club meeting the following week in the Burnie Inn. When I arrived, one of the chaps from the NSAP greeted me, and I joined him in a group of about 12 others at a nearby snug area in the bar. That's when a massive, muscular figure came up with a book in his hand. He opened it, and inside was a photograph with a yellow sticker on it, and the, the words, Paul Dunleavy Phillips works as a chauffeur for Jimmy Savile. I nearly fell off my chair. They'd found him that quickly? Yes. They had a huge network of subdivisional groups, including one called the Black Wolves, which sought out dark-skinned people for whatever reason. The intent being to cause them severe harm. <clears throat> right. I need some further clarity on this, Mr. Gallagher. You've stated <clears throat> that the photograph was of a black individual. Was he assuredly the same man who was with Savile on that fateful day when the attack took place on your sister? I had no doubt whatsoever then, nor do I now. It may seem an odd question to ask you, but how did it make you feel when you saw the image? My heart sank. All I could think about was incrimination, revenge. I felt I had to avenge what he'd been party to and destroying the childhood of a beautiful, innocent little girl. Please continue. Anyway, another man came over and introduced, and introduced the holder of the book as Richie Patton. Richie had a slight speech impediment, but he was a master in Krav Maga. Do you know where that is? Yes, I do. Well, it's been refined quite a bit now. Exponents of it like Patton can easily ob obliterate any individual within a matter of seconds. That's what they started training me on. For nearly eight months, once a week. 
Tell me how you came to be using a knife then. I wanted it to look like self-defence. And in the event of Philip's being physically handy, and believe me, he bloody was that night, I needed the blade. So you were aware of Phillips' location on the night in question. What was he doing there in the area when the attack on him took place? Did your group's research manage to uncover that? His mother lived nearby. That's all I can say now. Mr. Gallagher, as I've already stated to you, it's imperative that you tell me as much information as you possibly can. Please do not allow sentiment or false loyalty to encumber this process by your withholding of information. No matter how circumspect or irrelevant you may feel it might be, I can edit through everything at a later date and filter out extraneous information which holds no bearing on the potential outcome. Omitting to do that could well mean that I might miss a vital nugget of detail which could easily prove fatal for when I go to court. I could fail. I do not embrace failure with anything resembling affection. And you will be found guilty of premeditated murder with a mandatory life sentence, meaning at the very least 15 years in prison. Of that, let there be no doubt in your mind. So, provision of an answer to all my questions. Do you accept that? Okay. Right. The NSAP poisoned Philip's mother with a regular dose of paraquat. <clears throat> I don't have the full details, but apparently, apparently they somehow administered a, a teardrop equivalent each day in her milk bottle. I remember what one of the group told me verbatim. It chilled me when I heard it. As little as one teaspoonful of the active ingredient is fatal. Death occurs up to 30 days after ingestion. Absorbed paraquat is distributed via the bloodstream to practically all areas of the body. The lungs selectively accumulate paraquat and therefore contain higher con concentrations than other tissues. This develops into lung and liver damage and renal failure results as the kidneys remove the absorbed paraquat. Death follows. Extraordinary. Apparently she had died. And Phillips had, had come home from the for the funeral. Mr. Gallagher. No. Perhaps it's time I informed you of something here. Something very, very important, as I feel it's only right that you're made aware of it. This is strictly off the record. 
Firstly, yes, Mrs. Floella Phillips did indeed pass away, but she had no family. And a special unit police task force was made aware of this as it allowed cover for some investigative work on another child abuse target, Cyril Smith MP. Uh, I, I don't understand. What about Phillips himself? He was her son. Mr Gallagher, the NSAP slowly murdered an entirely unconnected and unrelated woman. Their techniques were flawed. Your assault victims, i.e. Paul Don Levy Phillips, well, his real name was actually Benjamin Hardy. He was an undercover police officer. He was working a deep cover operation on a major joint task force case with A-10 and the Serious Crime Squad to infiltrate a paedophile network that had Jimmy Savile close to its core. The network includes high-ranking police officers, politicians, show business celebrities, and newspaper editors. And it's strongly linked to aspects of Freemasonry. Hardy, but will continue to use his operational name of Phillips, was getting close at the time of your fatal attack on him. <coughs> This information will never be revealed in court of law and must not be made reference to by you. Do you understand that? What's happening to me? This is insane. How do you know all this? I was recommended and informed by Detective Chief Inspector Frampton of A10 and the serious crime section. They've asked me to speak with you as they feel there are major obstacles ahead in their path to get this case under control again. The following morning, Gallica were taken from the police station cells to court and then remanded in custody at HMP Wandsworth. I had made a confidential report, including the information from the Rochdale Alternative Press. It made for shocking reading. I got it delivered to Detective Chief Inspector Roger Frampton of Scotland Yard's Anti-Corruption Unit. He called me down to London. Frampton had a trusted officer film our brief conversation outside. On the corruption within West Yorkshire Police, he was planning a major internal investigation into all the corrupt officers involved at the time of the complaints made against Jimmy Savile, Cyril Smith and others. Really grateful you've intervened in this Michael Galka case. Thanks for involving me in this procedure. I don't know what is. Um, I'll be speaking to Savile tomorrow afternoon, but um, in the meantime you said you had something you wanted to show me? Yes, um, see, we basically thought that all the Manchester complaints had been destroyed. Oh. But thankfully, a couple of the more decent officers uh, had decided to hold a few statements back and put them in storage. Now we can look at that in detail later, but what I've got here is uh, a transcript of an article from the Rochdale down to press. That's basically a summary, an outline of all the offences. It's just that, that bit there and over the page. Jesus Christ, John. Yeah. The Rochdale Boys Home where Cyril Smith operated uh, is the one he co-founded with little more than a brothel and torture chamber in permanent use just over ten years ago. In fact, that word got out and rapists as far as Sheffield would head there in an order to abuse the boys. Smith had a master key to let him into every room. Despite Rochdale, I'm out of leak. Putting boys over his knee and beating their naked buttocks. Disgusting, sir. 
He smashed children's teeth out with hammers and forced them to have sex. Good. However, the county constabulary was reluctant to investigate. Reluctant? So it took over an inquiry and intervened, but Smith was so certain the police would avoid him, he was weeping for them. Oh, Jack McCann helped him. He was the local Rochdale's Labour MP back in the 1960s. McCann. The law officer was equally appalled, and he killed the case stone dead. His good name cleared. His good name cleared. Smith carried out abusing boys well into the 1970s and following a meeting at a medieval banquet with Chief Constable Dennis Hibbert. He was introduced to Jimmy Savile. They then began, began an association where both parties engaged trouble-free and serious sexual abuse of youngsters, male and female. Smith himself was also widening his net to include some liberal activists. So a few of these officers, Roberts, David Steele, such a good liberalism. <clears throat> Power leads to abuse, and whether they are celebrities or priests in a Catholic church, if you allow vicious men to become untouchable, you're on the risk that they will be seriously sexually abuse any woman or child they desire. If, as with Jimmy Savile or Cyril Smith, you treat abusers as national treasures, you're in the additional risk that police officers or reporters will back away in fear of provoking an imposition. God. John, thanks very much for bringing this to my attention. Back inside, DCI Frampton then played me an audio recording made by his colleague DCI Michael Martin and DS. David Adams. I am recording this voluntary telephone conversation between myself, Detective Inspector Michael Martin of Anti Corruption Unit 10, speaking with Detective Sergeant David Adams. Now, DS Adams, please speak openly and candidly and tell me how you became aware of detailed public complaints regarding serious child abuse allegations involving. Jimmy Savile, Cyril Smith and others, and which were apparently abandoned and destroyed, with these actions being condoned by and within elements of West Yorkshire Police. Yes, sir. Chief Constable Dennis Ibberts had held a meeting at Stretford Station in Manchester. There we were all told to abandon the development of any complaints made against Savile and Smith and associated others, and that any further accusations of this sort were to be referred directly to him and not through procedural channels. We each of us were then obliged to sign the Official Secrets Act. Then there were these so-called uh, tea-drinking excursions at the home of Jimmy Savile. They took place in his, that Savile's, penthouse in Leeds, up on the fifth floor overlooking Round Hay Park. That's where he began this weekly ritual, and he called it his Friday Morning Club. Well, they were attended by people Savile trusted, a group of prominent local businessmen, city councillors and the like, from Leeds and Manchester. Tell me, D.S. Adams, did any names come up? Uh, just one name came up, Detective Sergeant Jack McIntyre. One of the chaps told me that on one occasion the group were asked to leave the room to allow just Savile and McIntyre to talk alone. Now, most of us are familiar with surveillance techniques so we set up some basic equipment and we overheard what was an intriguing talk between Savile and McIntyre. Savile said something to him about getting in touch with Surrey police because he was keen to sort out a situation with them and McIntyre could more easily manage the arrangement. I found out later what the situation was that he was referring to. Now what happened were, well, I beat Bobby, I'd been riding his bike past a lay-by two nights earlier and he chanced upon Savile's Rolls Royce backed up in the darkness. So he shone his torch inside the car and he clearly made out it was Savile with that familiar face and streaky white hair and there beside him was a very timid looking young girl no older than about 10 years of age. So the copper asked Savile what he were up to. I'm waiting for midnight, he replied. She'll be moist enough by midnight. Now piss off if you want to keep your job. So the constable duly cycled off but later on back at the station he told all of this to his sergeant. He told him to shut up and not mention this again, ever, because Savile had friends in high places. Well, the constable was very concerned about it, so though in strict confidence, like, he spoke to me in CID. 
Thank you, Detective Sergeant. I am now ending this recording. Next day, DCI Frampton managed to get Savile into Marlebone Station for what Savile assumed for an informal interview. And he deliberated in some detail on the heinous crimes Savile and others had committed. Savile didn't say very much. He moaned a few times, staring blankly at us, with an unlit cigar in his mouth, shrugging it off as if we <laughs> were all used to him. Then we played back some recordings of sexual abuse victims. So, yeah, yeah, he, he did it to me. Savile molested me. It was, it was just a few years ago. I, I was 14. It was right after I'd appeared on his show. He, he promised me, see, he said he'd get me a Jimmo Fix It badge. Those things were highly prized, you see. And I wanted to show it off to my friends and the scouts and at school. Anyway, I'd spent the day on the set of the show and, and I got a chance to go racing and look for all around Brands Hatch on the actual racing track. It was amazing. It was a fantastic day. I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. The actors, you know, them, them that played Starsky and Hutch, you know, uh, Paul Michael Glazer and, and David Soul, were over in the studio too. And Starsky, Starsky, he shook me hand and ruffled my hair. Oh, it was so exciting. Savile, he then told me that I could earn a badge of my very own, rather than sharing a group one with my scout friends, and, and that was what I really wanted. So he, he took me into a dressing room. It was in there that it happened. He took off his trousers and his underpants, and at that stage he was he was flaccid. You know, he, he asked me to touch him, like you know, I, I was almost in a trance. It, it was surreal, but I, I did as he asked, and and I, and, I, and I stroked his penis. Oh God! But one one thing that remains with me, oh God, where, where the horrible stench of him from his body, like you know, urine, sweat, and shit. Oh, it, it was beyond obnoxious. Anyway, if. He forced me down against the dressing table and he ripped down my shorts and my pants and, and he rubbed himself against me and he, oh, he, he climaxed immediately and then he threw me down to the floor and, and he wiped himself down with a towel and after I'd done up my shorts, Savile warned me, he said not to tell a living soul. It, it became really scary you know, and he said, don't you dare tell anyone, not, don't you even tell your mates, we know where you live. And then he said, nobody would believe you anyway, I'm King Jimmy. I was just 13, seven years ago. I was approached at the railway station. He spotted me in my school uniform and told me I looked really cold and would I fancy a cup of tea. I instantly knew who he was from TV. It was easy to recognize in his tracksuit. I just remember being very starstruck and thinking wait until I tell everybody about this. He bought me a cup of tea and a cake and asked me all sorts of questions. I told him I was playing truant and he wanted to know if I did it often. <sighs> When I told him I had to go, he said, I, can you give me your phone number? I thought it was a strange thing to ask, but he... The whole experience was just surreal. I went to give him my phone number, but he said that it would be too busy. A line and then he asked if there was another number he could contact me on. Well, you see, back then I lived with my grandmother. I was there because things weren't great at home, so I gave him my grandmother's number. But I never ever thought he would call. 
but then about three weeks later he did ring our phone number and just wanted to arrange a meeting and the phone went and my nan answered but it went dead when she picked up and then about 10 minutes later it rang again and this time I answered it and Saville recognized my voice and said from now on refer to me as Vince can you be at Leeds station at 3 p.m. tomorrow I can't believe it now but I said yes He was famous, you see. I thought my friends would be envious and impressed. Anyway, I went along, along to the train station. And this huge car pulled up. And the window went down and the man peered out, moving to me, waving to come over. The door opened, so, well, I got into the car. And we sped off to what was to be Saville's penthouse home. Yeah, roughly it was like on outskirts of Leeds. And then the man, the driver that is, he led me into a lift and up to his big flat. The door opened and standing there was Saville, waiting. He gave me a glass of orange squash and we sat talking and he told me about his charity work and shows. I remember the inside of the place, it was very untidy and cluttered and worn carpets and white chairs. There were framed pictures everywhere with him and famous people like Prince Charles and that boxer with a belt over his shoulder. He talked to me up, like really close, he wasn't too physical that time he said that he has to be careful especially with the birds no nothing else happened that time as his phone rang and he told me he had to leave on urgent pop business so i finished my drink and i was driven back to the station but he called me again a few weeks later, just before my 14th birthday. Mm, exactly the same thing happened, but this time though he offered me alcohol and said that we should celebrate my birthday. Yeah, yeah, all right, I think. Thank you. <laughs> so I drank it quickly, and then I felt very odd. A blurry kind of feeling came over me. So I had to go to the toilet, but inside there was no lock on the door. I tried to be quick, but he came in with just these vile baggy phone color pants on. I could see he was aroused and he made me take his pants off. And then I undressed too. And he forced himself into me, over the sink, as he looked at himself in the mirror. 
looking back, I'm sure he'd put something like a drug in that drink. Gin, I think it was. But with something else. I felt so hazy and disorientated and such terrible, awful pain too. He smelled so horrible and disgusting. Bad breath and terrible body odor. He whipped my breasts with his belt and bit me on my chest and between my legs and then I don't know if I can say this he, he peed over my head and breasts and then slapped my face and I fell on the floor I woke up later and found myself in a garden near my house. My grandmother found me. She was so worried, but I just told her some friends had played a prank and we drank some alcohol. I'm so ashamed. Please <laughs> do something about it. Please. It was, it was back in 1977. My father had been taken into custody on suspicion of murder. He was, he was a carpet delivery driver and he'd found the body of a 70-year-old woman at the side of the road and a police, the police wrongly thought he might have killed her. Obviously, this was a traumatic time for me and my family. I was sent to my nan's and she tried her best to keep me away from the news, but I, I was still upset and confused. So I went to a nearby park in Leeds and, and sat on a swing. And then this smart black car pulled up. A creepy looking man got out and he came over and asked me if I was okay. He walked with me into the woods behind the park. And once, once he got me in there, he lifted up my shirt, pulled, up, pulled off my trousers and pants and rubbed some greasy stuff against my bum. And then I felt pain, like, like the worst kind of constipation in reverse, if you know what I mean. That's, that's the only way I can describe it. I was nine. The man disappeared really quickly and I lay there on the grass and twigs, not, not sure what had happened, but I was in total agony. I could barely walk in a straight line and my head was pounding. Sh shortly after I left the woods, I thought to myself, if you don't say anything, it never happened. If you just don't tell anyone, it didn't happen. And I, I never did tell anyone. I went back to my nan's house. I remember the next night, a, th a Thursday it was, m my nan put on the telly for me and it was top of the pops. The man who had raped me appeared on the screen. I had a panic attack and I ran to my room and hid under the bedclothes. It was Jimmy Savile. When I returned to my parents following my dad's release, I, I regressed for a while. I can still remember this feeling of abomination. I started wet in the bed. All the, all the classic signs were there, but everyone thought it was because my dad had been suspected of murder. I somehow squashed the whole traumatic, terrible incident down into something hard and dark and tiny and deliberately buried it as deep as I could inside. And in fact, I actually forgot about it. I forgot about it so much, so completely, that when I accidentally saw a photo of Savile in the Daily Mirror soon after, all I knew was that I was really frightened of him. It was like every ounce of me knew, but I didn't remember it, so I must have blocked it. Yeah, I, I managed to block what I call the incident but it affected everything in my life. You can feel that sense of panic, but, but not understand it or why it affects you on a daily basis. My life changed. When I was around 11, I joined an older gang so that I would have a bit of protection without really knowing why. I went a bit nuts in my teens, did drugs, started petty thieving. And as an adult, again, without knowing why, I always cut corners when walking the dog if it took me out too close to any woods. I went through my whole life not directly recalling the event, not really understanding what had happened to me. But every so often I'd have these massive depressions or anxiety attacks, really bad, 
dragging me into the pits of hell. It, it felt like the book of Revelations. The attacks would last a few minutes and sometimes I'd have to go to a clinic. In my thirties I tried counselling, but that didn't, didn't really help. It wasn't until two years ago that I went to see a clinical psychologist that something really changed. She asked me lots of technical questions and found that my problem areas were extreme anxiety around going away from home and feeling that the world was a bad place. She diagnosed me with PTSD and prescribed a particular treatment. I promised my wife I wouldn't speak about this, but, but I need to, because now I can remember most of what happened. Not everything, it's, it's like a shattered mirror. I have fairly horrific images, but I can't make whole sequences. But the point of my treatment is not to recall every detail of the traumatic incident, but to access the feelings around it. You stop every three minutes or so to assess how high your stress levels will become. At the beginning, I was off the scale. I would cry uncontrollably, snot and saliva everywhere. In fact, the process was so difficult that I quit a couple of times, but gradually, as I repeated the therapy, my stress levels reduced. I'm not cheerful about it now, but I own it now. Most of what happened has come back to me. Savile was a right fucking grubby bastard with piggy eyes and hateful stained and broken teeth like fangs and body odour like a drain. For a while during the therapy I was overcome by a desire for revenge. I wanted to meet up with Savile, sit man to man without any weapons and see what kind of person he was. But then I thought, well, this isn't going to happen and he's probably still a disgusting, horrible, manipulative, paedophile sort of character and he'd smirk at me over the table. Then it's going to go incredibly badly as I'd seriously rearrange his fucking features with my bare hands. You know, there were, there were a couple of children's homes near where I grew up and as a child I was very conscious of the kids who ran away. Once you've seen or seen someone get assaulted, you don't forget. That never leaves you. I remember looking through the railings of a nearby children's home. All the lads looked like something out of Auschwitz and there were glue scabs all round the girls' mouths. Those places were centres of abuse physical, emotional, sexual. I think about that. I was so affected and the abuse only happened to me once. I've had at least three breakdowns as a result. It's caused me a lifetime of anguish. So imagine what it was like there, all that brutality and you can't escape. Imagine being in one of those places where someone like Savile or Cyril Smith was able to come into your home whenever they liked. Well, I need, I need to go back some time to when I was nine year old. My two brothers and my sister had been sent to bed. I was being given a special treat, you see. I was being allowed to stay up late and watch TV with my stepfather. I was reading a comic and I was puzzled about a particular word. I wanted to know what the word assault meant. Asked him if it were like when funny people on TV say I, I've never been so assaulted in all my life. He looked at me in a really odd way. He had a strange expression on his face. I'll show you what he means, he said to me. He took me into my mother's bedroom. She'd be working late in a restaurant in town or something. He got hold of me and he undressed me. He took off me yellow pyjamas and then he took off all his clothes. I was just so scared. I knew it was wrong. I didn't understand. And he turned me over. So I was facing down onto bed and he pulled me up so my bum was pointing up the way. Then he... Then he heard, I heard him. He spat in his hands. And he rubbed them together. And then he forced his fingers. Deep inside me. Into both my vagina and me. The pain was like nothing I've ever felt before. More excruciating than I can ever really describe. I'm sorry. I 
that he, uh, he pushed himself his, uh, his penis. Deep into me. <laughs> Nothing will ever the same for me again. The next day, I, I could hardly walk. I was limping because of the pain. And I was afraid to go into school because I thought everyone could tell. But I couldn't go home because he was there, so I went into the side lane next to the playground with the railings. And I was crying, shivering and weeping. And my teacher found me there. She scolded me. And she told me I was a really bad girl. I already knew that. That nightmare, that awful night that started just because I asked an innocent question. Well, it repeated again and again over and over for ages. One time he even held a knife to my throat and threatened to kill me. If I told anyone what he called our little secret, especially to my mum. Or to anybody at all. How long did this continue? It must have been over two years. Then he was injured in an engineering accident or something and he, and he moved away. I never saw him again after that. But I'll never forget it. Even now. Can you tell me how these incidents equate to Jimmy Savile? Because they're out there. Men like that. They're still getting away with it. But Savile in particular? My son. Alex. He was in Stoke Mandeville Hospital last year. He was only eight. He had to have his tonsils out. I'm sorry. This... This is so difficult. I only found this all out much later. When he came home, he, be, he be, went right really tearful and sad and, and you know. So I called the doctor and he brought in a child psychotherapist. Later a nurse from Stoke Mandeville were contacted with the doctor and she came to my house. Tell me more about what happened. It was during his 10 days in hospital. Alex was told by the nurse someone special was visiting. That's when it happened. The nurse opened the bed curtain. There was Savile. She closed the curtain, leaving Alex and him alone together. So I sat down on a chair beside Alex and he squeezed his hand before sexually assaulting him. My son. Alex was so distressed. I'm so ashamed. When I visited him, he told me he's on mum. I didn't believe him. I couldn't 
he even begin to imagine someone could do that to my boy my unwell little boy eventually though I realised he was telling the truth there were a few evenings after Alex came home from hospital I was just putting him to bed and I had my back to him Ford and shirt. And he said, he said, Mummy, penis is hurt me bottom. I got down on my knees next to your bed and asked him to repeat it because I thought I hadn't heard him properly. And he said, Mummy, penis is hurt me bottom. And penises in my mouth taste horrible. Over the next few months, four different psychotherapists independently examined my Alex. Each of them told me they all concluded that Alex had been sadistically and sexually abused by someone. You just don't believe this happens in real life, in your life. How can men do such horrible things? Mrs Barrett, I appreciate this is difficult, but please continue. After I've been told by the doctors what had happened to Ali, they kept him in for a few days in a secured clinic. That day I, I seized up. I sat in a dark corner of the spare room. I just lay in the bed. Overnight into the next day I just lay there. I didn't eat, I didn't drink. I didn't even brush my hair or clean my teeth. I just lay there. But there's more that I should tell you. I made friends with one of the nurses. She works at Stoke Mandeville. Uh, she told me about another of Savile's victims. A girl. She was only 12. When he raped her. In the hospital's television room. She was going there in a nightdress. But on the way, a porter approached her and asked her where she was going. That porter was Savile. And he went with her. And when they got there, they were the only people in the room. And they were alone together. The nurse told me that Savile pulled up a nightdress. She had no knickers on. So he pulled down his trousers. And he raped her. She didn't even know who Savile was. But my friend, the nurse, she said, she said later, she described him as horrible and he stank of smoke and disgusting sweaty body odour. That girl, she told another nurse that the porter had hurt her down there and she was told to say nothing because it might get everybody into trouble. That poor girl went to bed, but she was awakened. She was awakened in the middle of the night with Savile beside her bed where he sexually assaulted her again. After this she were in despair. 
And she wrote a note explaining what had happened with her father's name, address and phone number and put it in the post box. And I hope that someone would contact him. But nobody did. Please, you need to get these people. You need to make it stop. Stop them doing things like they did to my son. The horrible bastards, filthy, disgusting bastards. My poor Alex, he's my little boy. They need locking up. They get a vile kick out of five minutes of their lives, five minutes of their stinking, disgusting, filthy lives. But they change those lives of those children forever. They'll never forget it. They'll stay with my son forever. And you're doing nothing. Now, let's elaborate on this. Paedophilia, sexual attraction to prepubescent children, seems to make everyone in the nation angry and sick at heart. Yet you have had well over 300 complaints. 360, in fact, made against you for this. Do you imagine all those people, none of them who know one another, would conspire to make seriously defamatory and highly detailed complaints about you? 360, Jimmy. Oh, that's a big number. Everyone who has ever lodged a complaint about you is wrong, and conversely, you're always right. That's the way it is. Quite. Dears Pierce. How regularly do you drive to care homes, hostels and hospitals? Drive? What would you have been driving last spring, for example? Oh, I don't know. I keep swapping cars out, I find this idea. Uh, could be... Well, I live in the north of England, so I keep most of my vehicles up there. But I keep one down here from running about, so... For that time, it would probably have had uh, a Rolls Royce. Take your pick, anything. You drive that yourself? And you get someone else to accompany you? On occasion, I use a, a chauffeur type thing. Did you hire a black Negro driver last spring, for example? Yeah, yeah, I did. Paul knew his name was. Paul didn't leave you, Phillips. You got him to drive you throughout February to July last year, 1978. If you say so. You're all doing your jobs, so you must know the dates better than I do. So you got him to drive you in your old Royce to Radio 1 Roadshow in Whitby, I presume. I expect. And he helped you abduct and sexually assault on an attempt to rape a four-year-old girl in Granton Lane, May 17th, 1978. No, no, not true. There seems to be a pattern emerging here. So to be clear, and according to you, there are people in forensics to whom you claim you can give material to and to have a look as a favour. You claim you know them. And of course, the other unnamed police officers with whom you drink tea at your home was finding, finding amusement in looking over your alleged correspondence. We have confirmed one is DS Jack McIntyre, even though you deny knowing him. Name any others. Off the top of my head, I can't have them on. Highly trained, highly skilled, highly proficient forensic personnel. But you can't name any of them. Is that what you're saying? Well, yes. This is a statement manifested from a position without foundation simply to satisfy your craving for attention, isn't it? Don't insult my intelligence. I didn't expect this, you know. I'm bloody well certain you didn't. Now, none of the aforementioned complaints, numbering over 300, 
which were made against you resulted in charges being brought. However, it is my intention to thoroughly investigate the aforementioned cases we referred to, and in so doing, I have resourced a team of highly trained officers whom I have been working closely with with the forensic team in Scotland Yard. And guess what they found, Jimmy? I'm sure you're about to inform me. Indeed I am. Well, we have managed to gain fingerprints from a brooch and a headband, those same items which were worn by the young girl in Whitby. The forensics team, upon intensive examination of said items, found adult male fingerprints, which were not those of her brother. So we will be taking your prints shortly, Jimmy Savile. Also found were cigar traces on the clasp. Cigar traces since sourced to Romeo and Julieta Churchill's, the brand you use with alacrity and frequency in an attempt to look impressive for the camera. And lo and behold, here we are. You have one with you, with your prints on the cigar package. I was about that then. In addition, semen stains were found on the person of the young victim and it can be assumed with little doubt that these emerged from the body of, again, one James Wilson Vincent Savile. Do you have anything to say? It's out of the question. On the contrary, it is well within the question that you can offer no answer. Right. If, if indeed all these incidents that you refer to, if they did happen, and I'm not saying they did, or that I did them, but if I did, if they did happen, the girls deserved it, all of them, especially the young ones, like that one on Whitby you mentioned, she probably liked it, really. They all did, I would, it's what they want, but you'll never pin anything in me. No way, nothing, you'll never put anything in me. You may regard yourself as being above the law, but you're not. Let me ask you something. Do you have any fears? What is this? Where's this going? You see, for some people, their biggest fear may be death. For others, it may be feeling suddenly under threat, under severe physical threat. This is DCI Roger Frampton. Time is 8.37 p.m. and I'm terminating this interview. DS Richards, cease your note taking now and please leave the room. DS Richards, leave the room! What is about to happen will stay within this room. You cannot and will not report it because and I do hope you feel the irony here. No one will believe you. No one! 